interface with our nonprofit community, as well as um, bringing experiences of having to work in partnership with, with government. Also joining us in following Michelle is Jill Takuda. Uh, Jill is a former state senator um, from Kailua Kaneohe. She served from 2006 to 2018, where she chaired the very powerful Ways and Means Committee. And having that background and, and really understanding, you know, our state budget will be very valuable to our conversation today. She also is, is the external director of the Nisei Veterans Memorial Center and is an independent contractor with the Hawaii Data Collaborative. A lot of the data that uh, Jill is going to cover this afternoon comes from the Hawaii Data Collaborative, and I'd really encourage you folks to visit that website at www.hawaiidata.org. It's a, a rich uh, entree of, of information that is very layman um, in the way in which it's laid out. So I really encourage you to do that. And then following Jill, we're very fortunate to have Melissa Unemoriham, who's a consultant with uh, consultant and partner with Scott Rasmussen. They've done over 120 uh, independent um, projects like the one she was commissioned to do uh, by the um, House COVID Committee that was sponsored by, by HCF. Uh, she formally served for 11 years with Congresswoman Patsy Mink and then about five years with Senator Dana Kaka. So she comes to our panel with a tremendous amount of of congressional and federal experience. And so we're really looking forward to our conversation uh, this afternoon with our, our three panelists. We can go to the next slide, please. I wanna set the um, framework of, of, of why HCF engaged with the Federal Act funding uh, arena, because it's not an area that we actually prefer to be in or nor is it our wheelhouse, but we felt compelled to engage for for two reasons. And, and really, early on with the funds that you provided us, it gave HCF an opportunity to see very clearly where some of the, the greater needs are. And that was through our work with the Hawaii Resilience Fund. And, and we saw specific needs in, in the child care arena and emergency food. And, um, and we knew that if we were going to advocate that the legislature set aside funding for that, that we need to needed to be assured that, you know, if needed, we would step in to try, try to make that happen in an efficient and effective way. The second reason, which is what some of our conversation is gonna be about today was, we thought that if we could engage as an intermediary, there'd be a lot of lessons that we could learn. I'm not just on behalf of as an intermediary like HCF, but in the entire ecosystem, you know, how can we use this as an opportunity to from a really objective standpoint, try to identify ways that each of us as stakeholders in this ecosystem can do a better job to service the public and to use taxpayer dollars uh, in, a, in, a, in a more efficient way. So I'm interested to getting into that conversation today. So I'm gonna bring on Michelle uh, right now and she's gonna cover some of the work that HCF did. And then uh, we'll move on to Jill and then move on to Melissa and then we'll open it up to a Q and A. Michelle? Um, so this slide is really showing, um, un similar to many uh, other nonprofits, that the work that we were doing um, in response to COVID was really on top of work that was already happening. Um, and so this kind of shows you the dollars that were deployed from the Hawaii Community Foundation. Uh, we did over $12 million in just the Hawaii Resilience Fund alone. Uh, that happened very quickly. As soon as uh, we responded, we stood up a fund and through the process and the generosity of our donors, we were able to put over $12 million out into community. Uh, we also have CARES Act funds so far, what was actually spent and we're continuing to do uh, checks out the door as we speak till the end of the year. We will end up deploying the allocation that we had, but nearly 40 million out the door so far. Uh, we did a Stronger Together Scholarship Fund, uh, a little over two million. Um, and I don't have to read every single line item, but in total, the Community Foundation in response to COVID uh, really deployed over $60 million into the community around areas of serious need. Uh, and 
it is a lot larger than our normal grant making, our average grant making budget just from our discretionary grant making on an annual basis is about 30 million. So this alone is double the regular grant making budget. And so while this was going on, the normal work is still happening as well. Uh, and I share that because I think that that was the case, not just for Hawaii Community Foundation, but for every nonprofit that was called on to really respond quickly uh, to the impacts of COVID in our community. The next slide. Where HCF engaged directly around CARES Act, uh, we contracted with the Honolulu City and County um, and we will completely deploy the 37.6 million that went to uh, nonprofit organizations and some for-profit entities who did work to support um, COVID response in Honolulu. So these were nonprofit uh, entities that were specific to the Honolulu city and county. We also contracted with the Department of Human Services for uh, child care, a $15 million contract. And of that 15 million, we will um, have deployed about 11.5 million of that 15 million in total. Uh, we did 5 million in food with the state Office of Community Services uh, to support food banks across the state. Uh, and really, our Hawaii Resilience Fund did co invest in many instances into nonprofits, um, and it gave us a good overall picture and scope on where government dollars were going and how philanthropy could really fill in the gaps where government wasn't covering, whether that was administrative costs or overhead fees. So we really were able to see where we could plug philanthropy in to fill those gaps and needs in the nonprofit sector. The next slide. I think what we did learn and some of the top takeaways, we learned a lot. I'm just pulling three of the key points that I thought that were important for us to understand in this conversation. Uh, first and foremost, government and nonprofit sectors are natural partners. They're serving the same constituency. And so collaborating uh, is really a benefit to everyone in the state. Uh, we really saw um, some lessons learned that we pulled from this and saying that collaboration between the nonprofit sector and the government sector really needs to start early on before contracting, uh, open and honest conversations before we even get under contract so that we can avoid um, some of the challenges that they face in trying to deploy capital quickly. Um, we also note that through this process, some of the neediest in the community are most vulnerable and lower income populations are required to um, provide an intense amount of paperwork that makes deploying the capital out to community really burdensome on the nonprofit sector. Um, and so there's some work that we can do together around uh, alleviating some of those pressures for the most vulnerable in our community. And then third, that there is a need for us to collaborate, collaborate on building the capacity of the nonprofit sector. Um, that the nonprofit sector is really the boots on the ground, engaging on the front line with community. They're able to be more nimble uh, than larger organizations and government uh, in responding, but at the same time, they often have limited capacity or have cash flow restraints. And so there is a need that we see to invest in the capacity of the sector that really comes forward to um, help, particularly in the time of crisis. And we also learned that there has been a good level of infrastructure infrastructure developed uh, through the COVID response that we feel needs to continue um, because it would be devastating for some of that infrastructure to be lost and have to rely on restarting again. Uh, we know COVID is far from done and so investment and collaboration about investing in the capacity in the nonprofit sector is key. Our next slide. Uh, the next slide, this really is showing you that particularly with rental relief and housing assistance, which was a uh, extreme pressure point for the sector because there's such tremendous need, uh, nonprofits took on over 18,000 applicants who needed assistance and have put out in the last couple of months almost $60 million in rental 
uh, relief and housing assistance throughout the state. Uh, it's a tremendous amount of work. Um, our key players there were uh, Aloha United Way and Catholic Charities. And so between the two organizations on the statewide level, uh, it was really a huge lift. And this slide is really showing that they were targeting and reaching some of the lowest income families, um, many families with zero income uh, coming in. And so they were heavily reliant on this assistance, but really gives you the uh, a sense of the magnitude of the ramp up that had to happen by these nonprofit organizations to truly serve our community. Thank, thank you, Michelle, uh, appreciate it. Um, we're going to now shift over to Jill, but before we do so, I just want to give a little background. You know, we we're very fortunate in that both the state house and Senate established committees to, to track um, the funding. And under the House COVID committee, which was led by Speaker Psyche, a subcommittee that was set up to track federal dollars that was led by Lauren Name from Kamehameha Schools and co-chaired with Jill Takuda. And what she's going to uh, relay to you is, is, is some of that backbone information on our performance and, and where it went. So I'd like to turn it over to, to Jill. Jill. Thank you, Micah. And I know many on this call have um, seen my presentations before. This one actually is slightly different because as we head towards the final weeks, um, with the coronavirus relief funds in specific, we really are starting to pivot and take a look now at, you know, kind of wrapping that up and showing where did a lot of these supports land? And more importantly, what does that kind of tell us in terms of going forward? Um, not just in terms of best practice and, and the good lessons learned as you'll hear from Alyssa, but where those supports are gonna continue to be needed. So I'm gonna share screen now. Um, And let me just start the presentation so that it's not too small on your screen. Hopefully you all can see that well now. So you might be familiar with my donuts, um, as I've often been uh, told they look like in terms of the category wheel. This gives you a good picture um, from what we can tell where the 1.25 billion that came to Hawaii in the form of coronavirus relief funds landed. And in particular, we started to tease out a bit on those categories that we know will definitely be areas of continued need going into 2021 and quite frankly did not necessarily exist prior to COVID. If we look back a year, these weren't worry points. We were not looking at over $350 million needed for testing and contact tracing and quarantine, uh, but those things will still exist on top of that uh, vaccine rollout cost as well. Um, $237 million plus dollars for food, for shelter, things like the restaurant card that help put um, food on people's tables and keep businesses open, uh, and over $260 million in small business and industry support. And this is not even including some of the other big federal programs like EIDL and PPP that were um, out there putting billions more into our economy to help keep businesses afloat. So this gives you a really quick bird's eye view of some of the big buckets of need that the CRF dollars help to meet, uh, but quite frankly, will continue to exist uh, come January 1st, 2021. To further expand on some of those identifications of where those needs are, and quite frankly, where many of those needs were met over the past uh, 10 months that we have been dealing with this. Uh, many of you are familiar with the PPP program, potentially benefited from it or know individuals who have been. Uh, what the Hawaii Data Collaborative has done is we're now starting to um, put some initial um, visualizations and mapping features so that you can actually see specifically where these dollars and supports landed. Um, I preface this by saying we are still working on improving this quite a bit, so uh, bear with us as we um, continue to modify it. But what we essentially did, if you were to visit this site, is we have put in all of the recipients of the Paycheck Protection Program into this database so you can actually sort it out. Right now, it looks like a lot of dots. But for example, we can look for nonprofits that are small and under 50, and you can see exactly where they exist, down to being able to hover on a dot and see which particular organizations got support and how much. If you wanted to get a little bit more granular, you could actually go and take a look at the NACE codes and filter by NACE codes, and you could do it by zip codes if you're only interested in a particular geographic area. We also have the aggregation tool that shows you some of the top industries based on your search. 
um, that received the funds, the total jobs that reported to be helped and saved as a result of these funds, and again, recipients by zip code. So you can see um, you know, where exactly these monies were drawn down in, in particular. For us, and especially for me, the big interest is not only where the dots lie, sometimes it's where the dots don't. And while there's very good explanation sometime for that, going forward, it might also help us as a tool to see where perhaps more capacity is needed to help um, you know, providers and businesses really make sure they can maximize on the drawdown of these funds. Because we do know capacity on the beneficiary side as well as the provider side, whether they be a LLC or nonprofit is often you know, a big concern. So that is one thing that um, this too can definitely help to, to feature on. Wanted to then also jump on another big category of need that will continue to go forward into 2021, and that is rent. Um, and Michelle talked a little bit about the rent relief program that was quickly stood up. What we wanted to do is quickly show you, based on the data from um, a couple of weeks ago, so a lot has been added since, where the rent subsidies have been distributed. So as you can see, obviously, a vast majority of the dollars um, and the approved awards are on Oahu, given the density but significant portions also on Maui, Kauai, and Hawaii Island. And this does not include the county-based programs. This is only the state-funded programs. But this gives you a high-level view of the total dollars put forward for rent support, mortgage support, uh, the number of households in each one that were supported um, statewide by county. Looking a little bit more specifically, again, to those areas of need, um, we also went through it and was able to sort it by zip code. So you can actually see jumping around. If you hover over, uh, it's not hovering. Well, of course, it's going to be working in the test run, but not now. Um, if you are able to get our PowerPoint, you can actually hover over the shaded zip codes and by zip code, see how many households received subsidies um, and how many families were actually supported. For us, that was important to also be able to see where areas or pockets of need exist based upon those who received awards, but also take a look at where you had particularly lower amounts of recipients uh, and really be able to address the question as to whether or not uh, there were capacity issues, both on the recipient side and the person applying for it, as well as the provider side. Um, so again, lots of beneficial uses going forward in both seeing where we disperse quite a bit and perhaps where um, we saw far less coming in. Um, and then this also helps to give you a sense of the kind of need that we're talking about for things like a rent relief program and why we're probably not close to having these kinds of supports um, being phased out. This shows you the average median income by county um, of recipients for the program. In many cases, you can see no reported income. This could be because of loss of job due to COVID, um, not receiving UI or waiting for that to be processed and self-certification of income. So quite a bit of them, um, unfortunately, are well below the 100% AMI for their particular areas. And to give you just a, a sense of what that means, if you're in the city and county of Honolulu and you see a big bump on the 40%, that means for a family of four, you make just over $50,000 a year, which really isn't much to be able to cover the costs of living as we know too well. And to also really break it down even more granularly, um, taking a look at where you know, the pockets of need do exist um, and how the face of poverty, quite frankly, is really changing and exists in every particular community. We took two communities that had very similar numbers of awards granted, um, Hawaii Kai and Waianae. So two far ends of the island, uh, as well as the median for Honolulu. And what we um, were surprised to really find is that um, they had very different levels of income gap in the sense that what you can see, especially in Hawaii Kai, is renters there, homeowners there that got mortgage support. The gap between the median income and what they're currently bringing in is significantly wider than, for example, in Waianae and even Honolulu. Uh, it's over three times as much um, the median income to what we're seeing for the median income for renters that receive these kinds of supports. Um, a lot more mortgage support in Hawaii Kai than even the median for the entire island of Oahu. Uh, but at the same time, you know, it reminds us that where we think need exists 
uh, where we think poverty exists and struggle in Alice families, it may not necessarily be the same zip codes that we've always been accustomed to taking a look at. And so having this kind of granular data helps us really, again, to start getting really um, deep in terms of knowing where some of these prevalent needs are um, so that we can better determine how we can support them going forward into the future. We also want to take a look at food, another large bucket of need that we know significant dollars went to support that with the coronavirus relief funds um, and that need will continue. Um, we started to look at uh, this concept of a food deficit, essentially the difference between how much a household has to spend on food and how much that they would need based upon the USDA thrifty plan, um, which really doesn't amount to much. At the end of the day, the thrifty plan basically says a family of four in Hawaii um, needs about $10 a day per person to be able to eat nutritious food and not, you know, cheap $2 tacos from Jack in a Box. Um, all those are very good, I will say. Um, and this basically shows you when we've taken a look at the income, various census data, and accounted for a lot of the impacts of COVID, this is where we find the house, the food deficits line. You know, over 149,000 households on Honolulu, uh, 25,000 households on Maui, 34,000 on Hawaii Island, 10,500 on Kauai. These are really where the pockets of need um, are particularly high in the sense that these individuals don't have enough food um, money to put the kinds of food that they need on their table um, on any given day, week, or month. And this kind of breaks it down for you in terms of what those households look like statewide. When we did our calculations based on what we found statewide, there's about 219,000 households that don't make or bring in enough dollars to be able to put um, sometimes even 17% of their household income towards food. Uh, so they are in a food deficit, and many, as we know, are also in food deserts where they can't access nutritious um, food as well. So over 219,000 households struggle with hunger um, every day right now. When we took a look at what it would take to bring them up on average to a point where they could be eating, they could um, be having that thrifty food plan um, amount, it was about $378 a month. So, you know, if you think of it relatively to how some of us might quickly spend $378, $378 would make a difference in these 219,000 households to be able to really feed their families the way that they should be and not face the daily struggles of hunger. Aggregated, yes, it's a big cost if we were to take a look at it, $82.9 million a month statewide. And while we know that we could never make anyone whole by providing that per month, it does show you the the vast need that every month there is a, a loss, there is a gap of $82.9 million in people's budgets that they can't put towards food that they need. That's the price tag of hunger in our state on a monthly basis. And just to kind of round it up, you know, um, Micah and Melissa were both talking, uh, Michelle, excuse me, about, um, you know, HCF and some of the food distribution programs that they have done. And this is just a snapshot again, uh, based upon just data only up until November of the food distribution drives that HCF did. Um, if you take a look at the number of drives and distributions they did, the number of households served, what you can see that as many as 50% of households with food deficits were helped through HCF administered programs in any given month. Uh, Maui, uh, the month of September being one, where based upon the number of food distributions and boxes given to households and understanding how many food deficit households exist in that county, um, help went a long way. You know, I was at the uh, food bank's distribution this morning at Aloha Stadium, 3,500 cars lined up to get those boxes. So you can imagine, based on what we know, where the deficits lie, and how many people on Oahu and statewide are struggling to make ends meet every single day, those 3,500 boxes will help feed those families likely for well more than a day, likely a week or more. Um, and that's really going to help reduce this large deficit that we're looking at. $378 a month for these 220,000 households uh, could mean that they can feed their family. Um, and reduce the impact of hunger. So I'm gonna wrap up here. I know I've talked long enough um, and really encourage you to, like Micah said, visit our website where we have um, much more information um, on the status of the CARES Act and how the funding has gone down. Um, and we will be now pivoting to also show where those supports have landed and more importantly, what we know 
going forward into the future. So thank you. Thank you, Jill. Um, before we move on to Melissa, I'll just give a little bit more background again. So again, Melissa was contracted uh, by the House COVID subcommittee chaired by, by Jill and Lauren Nami. Um, very fortunate. She comes from a um, very reputable uh, company called Skog Rasmussen. It was very important you know, for those engaged that this report not be a finger pointing exercise, that it was something that um, was looked at by all stakeholders in the ecosystem about how we could you know, do a better job to build our capacity to have stronger relationships. And at the end of this, really be able to serve uh, our public better uh, and use taxpayer dollars better. And so that's really the intent and spirit of this report. Um, and hopefully that will be some of its results. So I'd like to bring on Melissa. Okay, thank you. I'd like to start off by recognizing HCF for having the vision to make this investment to capture the nonprofit experience using CARES Act now while it's still so fresh in everyone's minds. And so we'll have the lessons learned report coming out sometime in the next couple of weeks for this project. And um, what we did to get there was to scramble a group of nine people who have collectively significant experience in both the nonprofit, the government, and that's federal, state, and local government, and private sectors, so that we could really look at the intersection of these sectors in what has been a massive public-private partnership that was the response to COVID. And so what we've come up with is really just the initial conversation starter. It still needs more assessment, it needs more analysis, probably more interviews, but at least to start talking about what things could be done better. And really, as uh, you know, it said, it's been said earlier, we're not trying to point fingers. We're really just trying to objectively together figure out how we can make the processes more efficient and more effective so that assistance can get to the families and get to the individuals that really need it the most. Some of these that Jill has been talking about. So this is for two lenses, really. The first one is, you know, looking in the short term in the event that additional federal funding would flow. And so we have to see what happens over the next few days, what the Congress will do with that. And then in the long term, as we look past COVID, because there are hundreds of millions of dollars in competitive grants that are out there for a myriad um, number of uses, as we try to address you know, systemic issues that can ease that sort of federal grant making and, and what's available for a better Hawaii. And so with that, what we did in this slide was interview 16 different nonprofits and they were really quite candid about their experiences because what we said was we were going to report your information in the aggregate so that we wouldn't possibly jeopardize any kind of future relationship with any funders. And with that, they told us quite a bit, which you'll see in the findings when the report comes out. So although 16 doesn't seem like a very large number, this represented a good 265 million in CARES Act funding. And this is not PPP. This is you know, through the Coronavirus Relief Fund, through the state, through counties, or through intermediaries like HCF, or you know, for those nonprofits that already had federal funding through various programs that happened to receive increases through CARES. So things like early childhood education, social services, healthcare, community development, and so many other areas. We also talked to four government entities, and here uh, we did not say that we could identify the interviewees, but we got a sent to identify the agencies. And so that's why you'll see we talked to DBED and DHS at the state level, and then two counties, County of Maui and City and County of Honolulu. So we finally also talked to the Housing Subcommittee under the COVID Select Committee for housing program case studies, which I think you'll find pretty interesting. And so if we can get into the next slide. Uh, this, there's a lot on this, but I'm not going to go into very much detail on it. You know, go ahead and read through it. But this shows you the structure that we use for the interviews that outline the different parts of the process nonprofits go through in terms of applying and securing funds, using them to run programs, to finance programs, and then later the reporting and auditing. So there were three general themes that emerged. Number one, that those nonprofits that were already experienced with government funding had a much easier time. And those that didn't, didn't. And so, you know, some of those smaller, less experienced nonprofits really faced major delays and hardships. But if they dealt with an intermediary like HCF that really accepted a lot of the risk and the process burden that Michelle was talking about and spare them that, then they had a much easier time. So that points to a lot of the need for capacity building. The second thing is that this was hard work. 
you know, trying to stand up new programs and face the deadlines that trickled down because of the December 30th deadline for the CRF. That was hard. You know, it, several of the nonprofits reported working 60 to 80 hour weeks for weeks on end. And that took a toll on the staff. There's a lot of staff burnout. They had staff turnover. They also had to shelve some of the regular programming that they're used to conducting and put that on the side for the time being. They also ran into some issues with the way some programs are financed. Now, there were some that did a good job and um, provided advances like DBED where they gave perhaps 50% so that the nonprofits could quickly stand up their programs and implement them. But others were on a reimbursement only basis. So it's something that we have to really look at, especially for those organizations that have shallower cash reserves. So the third thing though, the upside is that there were a lot of positives that came out of a massive infusion of funding. And so, you know, nonprofits were able to test their programs in ways they couldn't without the situation that we have in our labs right now. They were able to implement innovations, things in data collection and reporting and other things that they probably wouldn't have had the resources to test. They were also able to find a lot of amazing talent and although some of those positions are going to end when the funding does go away, I think some will be able to continue. And then finally, a lot of nonprofits reported having a seat at the table in certain discussions where they didn't find themselves before. And so again, among all of the negatives, a lot of positives. My last slide then next. Um, this one is about the government interviews and really the findings there fell into four different tranches as you see here and the biggest if we can address this one, then we can solve a lot of the other issues is, is risk versus trust. And it's trust on behalf of the government agencies that the nonprofits would be good stewards of the federal dollar, you know, no fraud, it, you know, money was going to be spent where it needed to be spent. But also trust on behalf of the nonprofits that government had their backs, you know, that they were a true partner with some give and take. And so that speaks to what Michelle was talking about earlier, you know, talk and collaborate before contracting. Um, but some nonprofits didn't feel that was present in certain areas. And so it's those cases where you saw some delays, um, re reimbursement delays and that kind of thing. And you can see some of that in the report. Otherwise, you see some of these other issues, timeliness versus compliance. So the effort to balance demands due to the spending deadline with the need to ensure compliance with the guidelines that were often changing, uh, especially from the federal level. You also had implementation versus the legislative mandate. So the effort to balance the practical day-to-day -day program implementation versus what was actually written and required in the legislation. And then finally, you know, the question of keeping versus streamlining processes. You know, how do you balance the assets and processes already in place with the need to reduce the burden on awardees and do this in a very quick time frame? So there definitely was hardship and a lot of need to balance on behalf of the government entities as well. So let me stop there and um, turn it over and look forward to a larger discussion on this. Thank you, Melissa. You know, while, while we have you up, I wanted to hit one of the questions that came in a little earlier about the Biden administration and what you're seeing there. And I think the question was just trying to get at, are there some high priorities that we should be looking at on the competitive federal grant side that you're hearing about um, that might be beneficial to Hawaii? Absolutely. So just yesterday, I believe the administration put out a statement talking about the first 100 days and the need to come together around an infrastructure package. So, you know, the hope is maybe this is gonna stimulate the economy through additional projects and transportation, uh, maybe economic development, maybe water infrastructure. So kind of thinking along those lines and hoping that they can find the, the funding to um, have those grant programs move forward. And then there are also all these um, annual grant competitions such as in telehealth that's gotten so much more important right now in our virtual environment. So there's annual competitions through USDA, through the Health Resources and Services Administration. You also see money coming through broadband since there's been increased emphasis there. So USDA, uh, maybe broadband for uh, rural areas also through FCC and combinations with agencies like Department of Ed. Um, I've seen mental health. There's a lot of SAMHSA opportunities that are forecasted into the future. And we know those, those are urgent needs right now, um, sometimes hidden needs. Um, and also DOJ, Department of Justice, prisoner reentry, and, and also research. So those kind of buckets, there's a lot that people could hooey up maybe and um, you know, go after some of these competitive pods. Any, any thoughts on timing, Melissa, when, when Congress will, will take action on a final final proposal. Yeah. 
Well, you know, right now it's under debate. I think people are wondering whether they're going to have a short government shutdown, which is very possible over the weekend because we have our continuing resolution that extends regular government funding done today. Uh, and so I don't know that they're going to find the wherewithal to even just have a two or three day extension of that funding. Um, I think they're thinking it's going to be less impact because it's over a weekend, but, you know, everything's tied in together. So the regular federal appropriations that come around annually, plus this relief package that looks like it's going to be about 900 billion at this point. And we're still trying to figure out what's going to be in that. So. Thanks, Melissa. Michael. I want to direct the next couple of questions to you, Jill. And, and there's a bunch in there trying to get deeper data, but just at a high level, your perspective on on how, how, how Hawaii performed. Um, and Michelle would love to get your comments as well. But in, in, in addition to that, Jill, maybe you can touch on, there was a question specifically to, you know, unspent areas. Like, did we take down all of the re rental assistant monies on each of the islands? And I think there was another question on whether or not we are able to break down the demographic of some of the vulnerable communities, especially around Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islanders, Micronesian community, and, and that type. Maybe if you can just expand a little bit on those three areas. Yeah, no, definitely. I think um, obviously this was unprecedented territory for not just Hawaii, but every state in the country as well dealing with this. And it was a very short window of time that we were given to really push through $1.25 billion uh, right into the economy, as Melissa had mentioned. Many, almost all of these programs and services did not exist prior to March. You know, they weren't needed in any budgets. They were not accounted for. So a lot of this had to be stood up very quickly. We now, though, the benefit of that, have a lot more capacity, uh, as was mentioned at the nonprofit level, at government level, to be able to now push out these kinds of supports and get through eligibility issues. Uh, but that really was the, the really steep climb that we had to, to deal with, was the fact that it had never been there before. And to do this with fidelity, uh, given that so many different people had pots of money, um, we had to make sure that we did it right as well. So I think that um, that was one of the difficulties. But given that, Hawaii really has, um, it's been tough to get a lot of the expenditures through. But when you take into account the encumbrances, Hawaii really has done well in terms of moving these monies to me to where areas um, were most needed. So as you saw in my original chart, food, shelter, small business support, individual support, um, health. COVID response, immediately making sure that those resources were there for health safety needs. Um, it wasn't like it was spread out to areas where people couldn't point to and say, hey, that is really critical, wasn't really critical to what we needed now. So I think what you did do a great job in that regard. In terms of spending down individual awards, which sometimes can be difficult. And if you look on our charts, you can see variations on how many expenditures versus Pukas might exist in some of those things. The reality again was the administration, the legislature, everyone, we didn't have any idea of how much would be required to truly help housing, how much would be required to help, you know, food programs, how much would be required to help businesses, all of these different areas. Because again, this was completely uncharted territory, I think, but the fact that we have been able, at least from the state level, to actually cut checks to over 55 million people for rent and you've got millions more that are currently working its way through the pipeline as they head towards the end of the year. Um, from what I've heard nationally, that's being looked at as one of um, kind of the bright spots in terms of being able to rapidly deploy needed funding to people to keep um, you know, roofs over people's heads. And so I think there's a lot of things to be proud of. Uh, and now too, what we do have is we have an investment, as Melissa said, an in infrastructure that will be necessary if we are going to maximize taking in some of those hopeful future federal dollars that will be coming our way. She mentioned a number of the different programs that we can go compete for, but taking a look at least at some of the drafts coming through Congress, they're looking at housing supports, they're looking at childcare, they're looking at food, these very things, vaccine rollout. The fact that we now have a stronger infrastructure and pipeline to be able to deploy this quickly out into the field is gonna give us an edge and an advantage. Um, hopefully now we just need Congress to, to give us the money. You know, I think one of those questions, Jill, as it relates to, you know, the allocation of resources to certain sectors, I think from our experience, you know, I think the legislature got it pretty good in terms of the dollar amounts and where they allocated resources. And um, while there are, you know, some unspent dollars um, to a large extent, you know, it was more our capacity and um, maybe giving a bit more time, we could get those dollars up. 
Michelle, your thoughts on kind of our general performance as a state around the funds that you had a nexus to? Yeah, I mean, I definitely think that the state, I would agree with your assessment, Micah, that they put dollars in the most critical areas around food, childcare, business. Um, it was a challenge. And I'm really proud of uh, the partnerships that were formed to step up to that challenge, of course. Uh, it comes with a lot of hard work and a lot of criticism sometimes. But in general, I think that we did get a good amount of dollars out the door. Um, I think one of the areas that we could start to talk about as a community that Melissa um, was sharing in terms of federal dollars and what's available at the federal level, outside from what's coming to the next stimulus package potentially, our normal uh, federal programs where Hawaii um, is a small player in. We're not pulling down as many federal dollars as we could. And I do think that philanthropy has a role there. Um, oftentimes nonprofits are not pulling down those larger federal grants because it requires them to have a 10% match. Uh, given the shortages that we're seeing at the state level, it's really a consideration that we should give uh, in philanthropy that how do we encourage the sector to go after those federal dollars by both investing in their capacity and being willing to help raise uh, the dollars needed for those matches. Um, it will really help them to bring dollars into the state and then it's an overall plus uh, all the way around. I think there's some questions about unspent dollars in rent. I think out of the million dollars a hundred million dollars rather allocated to rental assistance. Uh, about 60 million of that uh, has already been deployed. And as you heard from uh, Jill, there are still more checks to be cut before the end of the year. I don't think we'll quite hit the entire hundred million that the state allocated, but there's a good chunk that's already been out. And then uh, the state, Honolulu City and County, when you look at those charts, got its own allocation because of the population and that's how the federal government dispersed CARES Act dollars. But each county on top of what you're seeing through this rental relief program got additional dollars directly to the county that was given to them from the state allocation. And, and there we can further break that down. But what Jill was sharing was directly from the state's allocation. Michelle, I want to stay on you. I want to stay with you. Well, Melissa, did you want to chime in on that? Go ahead. Oh, I wanted to chime in on a previous comment. So if you want to go continue. Yeah. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, yeah, no, this is just going back to what Michelle was talking about, about grants. You know, I mean, Hawaii has been successful in the process. I think, you know, looking back at FY19 alone, uh, there were more than $300 million that came to Hawaii nonprofits from the federal government across the board. And so, you know, if we can build the capacity there, if we can stand up technical assistance teams, maybe to help those nonprofits that haven't entered the process with just the Manini issues, which turn into large issues when you're trying to go through the submission, which is just registering with the federal government systems. I mean, these little things that are housekeeping, but they mean huge things and, and cost a lot on staff time and probably anxiety as well. So, you know, if we can build this grants culture for the state, we can all do better. Yeah, thank you, Melissa. You know, Joanne, I want to go back to Melissa's slide that has the, uh, the four sec sections or trust in, I think trust in risk was one of them. And there was four others, if you can bring that up. And no, the, not the recommendations, um, one back, one forward, one forward, one more, right there. Michelle, you know, I want you to share a little bit of our journey with Department of Human Services, because I do think there was a lot of growth within the ecosystem there, all players. I mean, it, it started off rough and, you know, we worked our way through it and, you know, we saw that scale and capacity growing. We also learned a lot about the sector we were working in. Can, can you share a little bit of that history and story that I think our viewers would really appreciate? Yeah, I mean, we did. Uh, for the Department of Human Services, they actually had to go through a process of promulgating rules in order to be grant makers because they're typically contractors. Um, so we had quite the process of getting those rules approved and in uh, in that rulemaking, there were some challenges for the nonprofits. And so we really had an opportunity to work closely with uh, DHS, as Micah said, somewhat of a bumpy start, but I feel like different, uh, we had a liaison, right? We had somebody from government, from 
uh, exec from the legislature helping to push on the agency and on the and us as the intermediary to really bring us together, acting as a liaison to help iron out whatever the rough spots were, bringing the AGs as we needed to. And I think it's a best practice on what we need to do, as I said, ahead of time. Um, but a lot of working together to build that trust, to understand that we're both after the same goal to get these dollars out to child care providers and to really work through all the kinks so that we could get the dollars out. Uh, it was an extremely fast turnaround. Uh, Eleven and a half million dollars uh, really within a 30 day window from the time we opened that grant process. And none of that could have happened without every partner being willing and able. I mean, we, we brought in extra review, reviewers for the grant making process. We had a liaison uh, at the legislative level. We had really willing partners within the agency. And while there were many challenges, uh, it was really just a great lesson learned as when we lean forward and push through those challenges, uh, the outcome was remarkable. We can look back today um, and we're really proud of the success and what we were able to get to the child care providers. And so if we just slightly revise our game plan before we start the game, I think we could have come out just a little bit better. But all in all, um, a lot of good lessons learned and how we can lean on one another. Because um, it's really in all of our best interest to work together the way we had to in that situation. Michelle, from the change framework, we've identified that child care and, and early learning, access to early learning is a, is a major inequity in our community and the lack of seats that are even available, even if you have the funding to, to get to it. I think you, you learned a tremendous amount in leading this for us. This is going to be a key component to bring back our economy to make sure that essential workers and people who are in the various key parts of our economy can get coverage. Um, we're not going to be there and it's going to take investment. What, what's your guidance on that right now? And, and share a little bit about what you found in, in that sector. You know, I really, I mean, there's the two things I think that are key um, that I learned in that sector. One is these are folks that are excellent at taking care of our children. Um, grant making and trying to report and comply with the federal regs, it, it might not be the strong point, right? We need capacity in that field. And, and there may be ways that we consolidate on the back end so that there's not so much paperwork and burden because their real focus is our keiki. Mm -hmm. uh, and we want them to focus on our keiki. So how do we help them um, be better at the compliance issues and doing the grant making. This was it was a new area for many um, on what the requirements were. And so there's some capacity that we can build in that sector. Um, and on the other side of the coin, it's really that we put caps on what we allow them to bill for their administration and overhead. And so as classrooms and early childcare have to reduce the amount of students they take to have comply with social distancing, um, but increase the number of teachers, that we really need to look at how we cap those administrative costs because it's going to cost more to get kids back into the classroom, back into daycare, uh, and it's gonna require more supervision uh, because of the compliance and to keep up with CDC requirements. So on both sides, um, there's some capacity to build um, and lessons learned on what their needs are in terms of grant making. Mm -hmm. This question, thank you, Michelle. Um, this question I think can go to any one of our panelists and um, really asking around, you know, how, how do we, or how does government decide on allocation to Oahu versus neighbor islands? Is there some formula that we use or who wants to speak? Well, Joe, why don't we start with you at a high level? How is that determined? Even starting from a legislative standpoint and then Michelle or, or Ms. Melissa from a local standpoint, even as a grant maker on our side, how do we, how do we make those determinations? Joe, you want to start? Yeah, that's always a tough question, you know, and I think especially for Hawaii being a small state, if you're California in a big state, um, your small, your cities got their own allocation. That wasn't even an issue. Uh, but in state, small states like Hawaii, you know, um, it really was the legislature sitting down and taking a look at how would they share the portion of the coronavirus relief funds that they got. 
um, you know, equitably with the counties, you know, and that was something they did right up front. You know, oftentimes it's done based on a per capita type of basis. But, you know, really, too, as you start to get a little bit more granular and specific in terms of if you're giving specific housing monies or other types of monies for education or food, you know, then you could use some data to get a little bit more granular to really identify, you know, what are the levels of need and what resources could really help create sustainable outcomes in those particular communities. So that's a little bit more complicated and it takes communication with the, the county, especially and having those discussions. But I think that's definitely something to consider. Um, it's easy to just maybe slice them by the dollars equally and give them each a equal share of the pie in that sense. But one of the things we found in our subcommittee to be really valuable was that we had county representatives um, at the table and they were able to talk with us about, hey, what if we paid for this and you paid for that? Or, or what best practice are you doing here that we could really help move our money you know, faster in other areas? Those kinds of you know, simple conversations between state and county and people on the front lines, as Michelle was talking about, childcare now seeing what they really need, that's going to help a more efficient distribution of the resources, I think, especially going forward. So um, that's probably a longer answer than you wanted, but I would say it's, it's complicated. But I think if we can get more granular, use data, and quite frankly, what we know by talking to the people who are right there up front, that's going to help us distribute resources better and, quite frankly, help it to really sustain out into the future. If I could Michelle, jump in Melissa, there. Melissa, yeah, you know, I mean, in working from the federal level, it was always really difficult. Whenever we thought about uh, using a formula, you're always going to create winners and losers, unfortunately. And so, you know, if we talk about um, the amount of time we have, you know, it was really quick where we had to do it on population in, in this case, I'm assuming. But, you know, if we got down to the data like Jill is talking about and actually focus on the outcomes that we really want, you know, does it? truly matter about the geographic lines, you know, if you have the right provider speaking to the needs that are there in the community that are most essential to meet, whether it's childcare or housing or healthcare or whatever it is, you know, it's, it's really about trying to figure out how do you get the grant money to where it is needed. So if we had the luxury of time and enough people to do this and the capacity so that we knew how this had to be done most efficiently, effectively, then, then we could do it. So maybe if we start now, you know, we can get somewhere like a, a year from now or so. Michael, I would just add to that, that I think the one of the beautiful parts about engaging as an intermediary through this process was that the Community Foundation had been working um, on our change framework prior to the coronavirus um, arriving here on our shores in Hawaii. And that data really highlights for us uh, where the greatest needs are in specific communities. So it, it highlights um, for us the inequities that we see and where we need greater investment. And so the uh, beauty of being an intermediary with CARES Act dollars was we could put uh, resilience fund dollars into the areas that those CARES Act dollars were not reaching. And so when we talk about the work at the Community Foundation and the change framework and why we care about data, it's really to highlight these underserved populations uh, or zip codes or socioeconomic status where we know that there's greater need. We saw, for example, um, very quickly that our COFA migrant community had uh, a much higher representation in their percentage of infections in their communities than they make up in our population, right? Under 15% of the population, but 40% of the cases. And so uh, we knew that we needed to invest in organizations that were directly impacting and reaching those communities. Uh, and so I think that it is a struggle when the dollars are coming from the feds the way they did, that Honolulu was the only county that got its own allocation. Um, but again, a critical role that philanthropy plays in, in filling the gaps when we saw what was happening and what allocations were made to each of the counties. Thanks, Michelle. You know, the individual where this question came from is coming from Hawaii Island, where obviously, you know, we have the highest rate of Alice families there. So you can see why the sensitivity to the question. So thank you for that question. You know, there was a couple other pieces of information that we wanted to present, but I don't think we're going to have the time to do it. But I really do appreciate, you know, our panel's engagement. As Melissa said, you know, we're working through the final um, crossing of T's and dotting of I's of, of this report. We think it's important that, you know, certain stakeholders get a chance to take a look at it and have some input. 
um, to make sure that it's a fair and objective look at, on, on behalf of all stakeholders. So that will be coming shortly. Um, as we look into 2021, you know, our leadership team at HCF is um, clearly seeing a continued need. Um, quarter one, quarter two, as Congress, you know, and uh, the new executive leaders at the federal level make determinations, there's going to be a lag and there's going to be a need for resources. So we're trying to build up that capacity, both financial and human, to be able to fill the voids that we'll need to. There will be a focus on vaccinations. Um, the governor, um, you know, had a, had a, we had an opportunity to, to speak with the governor a couple of weeks back, and the goal is to get over 700 uh, people vaccinated by June 30, 2021. That's a major lift. Um, and so we hope you all will continue to support this effort. We thank you folks for um, the support you've given us to date. Um, we take that uh, honor and, and that is very much a big privilege. We hope you all have a wonderful holiday season with your family. Yay. Please stay social distance but also uh, enjoy yourselves. And we look forward to a much better 2021. Mahalo everyone and thank you for your continued support.